The Truth Can Get You Killed, a Paul Turner mystery. Author, Mark Richard Zubro, publisher, St. Martin's Press, New York. Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 7. They drove back to the city, looping through the mistakes in the suburbs, where traffic from three major highways converged into just three lanes off the Eisenhower Expressway. Even with the light holiday traffic, uh, there was a delay in the city. Uh, they took the Ashland Avenue exit off the Eisenhower North to Belmont and then east to Broadway. The offices of the paper were on the east side of Broadway where Buckingham dead ended. The three-story building was built in the last year by the owner of the paper, who discovered the Gay Tribune had turned into a small gold mine. The owner rented out a third of the top floor to a gay law firm. During the Pride Parade last June, uh, they draped what they claimed was the largest rainbow flag in Chicago from the roof. Uh, they parked in the bus stop at Melrose and Broadway. The walk to the paper chilled them thoroughly. A secretary directed them up two flights of stairs to Ian's office. Computers were strewn amid the modern, polished, chrome accent pieces, all softened by the deep gold carpeting, recessed track lighting, and pleasantly overstuffed chairs grouped around solid oak coffee tables. Even on the holiday, several people were hunched over computers. Thursday was deadline day. Ian met them at the top of the stairs and led them to an office that was the opposite of the pristine neatness outside. Before he opened the door, he said, this is not the guy who talked to me first. I found someone more reliable. How? Turner asked. Sources, Ian answered. Turner frowned. He hoped they didn't get into a fight about who was getting information from whom and what needed to be revealed. They entered Ian's office. Tattered posters of long-closed art exhibitions covered two of the walls. Huge maps of the city covered another wall. One map had congressional districts drawn on it. Another had the state legislative districts outlined, and there was a third with all the wards in the city. Cork board covered the wall around the door. Messages crammed all the space around all three sides of the opening. On the edges of the chaos were several beefcake calendars, not all of them from the new year. All but one were turned two months with pictures of extremely attractive men. The newest one had Mr. January in Western gear. Turner liked the one from June of 1987. That picture showed a slender, bare-chested man in tight black leather pants, straddling a sleek black motorcycle. When they entered the room, a lanky young man stood up. Ian introduced him as Bill Gary. Ian sat in the nicked and scarred wooden swivel chair. With his right index finger, he shoved his slouch fedora far back on his head. Billy perched on the edge of the desk. He wore black warm-up pants, a white hooded sweatshirt that said Oxford, and black running shoes. The bulky clothes did not hide the fact that he had broad shoulders and a narrow waist. Fenwick leaned against a file cabinet on the far side of the room. Turner rested against a blank space on the corkboard wall. The four of them filled the small room and made the atmosphere seem close. You guys are cops? Gary asked. They showed their identification. Gary nodded. I wasn't sure about this. I'm still not definite, but once I heard that Judge Meade was dead, I figured I'd better tell somebody. Then I called. I've been tracking down everybody I know who had any connection with the courts. I met Billy at... Ian hesitated. Gary said... I'm not doing anything illegal, and I'm not ashamed of what I do. I'm a dancer at A Naturel, and I go to law school at Loyola. How does that work? Fenwick asked. And Gary looked confused. I don't understand. What do you mean? They don't seem like compatible professions, Fenwick said. Why not? I don't dance on the tables at the school. I don't bring my books to study at the bar. I'm just curious, Fenwick said. Uh, but why do you do it? I need a job to get myself through school. My parents threw me out of the house when I told them I was gay. The money's good. I made more than anybody I know on their side job. It's better than toting barges and lifting bales. 
and I like the attention. It also helps that I'm an exhibitionist. What's your connection with Judge Mead? Turner asked. I had a project last spring in one of my classes. It was in a federal appellate decisions. And they've got that terrific library in the new Kennedy Federal Building. So I was down there a lot. I stopped in a few of the courtrooms and I wound up listening to the arguments in the DuPage County case. You know, the one about the gay rights. We know, Fenwick said. Gary looked surprised. Turner said, So you knew Judge Meade by sight? Yes. The important thing is, I saw him last night. Where? In all natural. You're sure? Turner asked. It was only a quick glimpse. Some guy had just dropped a $10 bill in my G-string. That's ten times what we're used to, so I'd given him a little more than a hug and a peck for his efforts. He offered me... And Gary looked at Ian. I had said, you can tell him about the offer. Don't go beyond that. Are you his lawyer? Fenwick asked. Go ahead, Billy, I had said. Gary nodded. I was startled at the amount of money he offered me to go home with him later that night. I had said, the dancers are often offered gifts and favors. And money, Turner said. Let's get on with it. We're not here to bust you for prostitution. And Gary said, this was about 11. I wasn't sure where I was going after work, and he offered me more than the going rate. I told the guy I'd have to let him know. He was nice about it, and I gave him an extra nuzzle or two, and he, well, never mind about that. Grabbing the crotch of pulling the G-string out and catching a peek at and rubbing the front of the dancers were not uncommon practices. Turner always figured the owners must pay a high amount of graft to keep from being hassled by vice. I got done with that guy. I was standing up, and right behind him was Judge Mead. What was he doing? He wasn't looking at me. He was trying to get past the dance floor area. It was really crowded, so it took him a while. I doubt if he would recognize me. He couldn't possibly know me. There was always a crowd in his courtroom. Besides, I was wearing a lot less last night than when I was in his courtroom. Did he give you money? No. I don't know where he went. How long he stayed, or what he did. I only saw him that once. He disappeared, and I kept dancing. I didn't see him the rest of the night. When did you find out he died? After I called. I didn't get up until after one today. I ate breakfast and watched some football games. I turned on the local news during halftime. Billy was my 19th call. I was deep into my list of sources. Look, Turner asked Billy. Are you sure it was him? I testified to it in court. Did you mention it to anybody else last night? When I got back to our dressing room, I made a general announcement. I couldn't believe that a notorious homophobe was in en naturel. I assumed it meant that he was a closet case. Typical. One of our own prosecuting us the most. Thank you, J. Edgar Hoover. What did the other dancers say? Not much. Most of them aren't very political. We're all pretty young. The guys are out for a good time and to make money. I had to explain to a couple of them who he was and that he was anti-gay. Tell me about the dancers, Fenwick said. I need some sense of who they are or who they hope to become. They're just guys. Some are straight. Majority are gay. I mean, what do they do when they aren't dancing? They aren't in law school or visiting courtrooms. I don't know a lot of them. A few are in school like me. Most of us do a little hustling on the side. Lots of them live in cheap apartments. They spend all their money on party, alcohol, and drugs. Especially drugs. A lot of them sleep until 3 in the afternoon. After you get up, if you've got half a brain, you go to a gym and work out. Or at least jog or run. Do something to keep in shape. And then you dance and party and go nuts. It can be lots of fun. How do they get out of the business? Some become full-time hustlers. Most just drift into other things. A few try to be those dancers for hire at parties. It's a life that doesn't have a lot of benefits or a pension program. A rare few find her and are able to settle down with a sugar daddy. Doesn't happen often. I've heard of it, but I don't know anyone that has actually happened to. 
At our natural, do the guys run into problems with customers? Being too forward or too friendly? A few clients get a little rambunctious. Mostly not. The pay is worth it. Sure. I like money. As for Judge Bean, if he was a closet case, the dancers would have loved him. Why? One of the guys said it for all of us. Those closet cases may be a pain, but they pay the most money. Which is true. Closeted guys did pay a lot. Blackmail? Fenwick asked. And Gary laughed. A prostitute has some honor. Do whores and their clients really even know each other's real names or care much, even if they do? Unless they're long-term clients or long-term whores. In which case, the relationship is different. Why bust up a steady meal ticket? Turner stuffed the blackmail possibility high on his question-to-ask list. If it isn't blackmail, why do they pay more? Fenwick guessed. Stupidity. Desperation. Gratitude. Maybe it's a sort of blackmail payoff in their own minds or making up for guilt. A way of solving their consciences. You'd have to ask them or someone who's a prostitute at A Naturel. You pay a dollar for, at most, a few seconds of touching. If you figure out why men go to prostitutes, you could write a book and be famous. Somebody probably already has, Fenwick said. Anybody mentioned to you if they saw him the rest of the night? No, but I didn't ask either. I don't know any more than I've already told you. It was such a crazy night, and he's not the first politician to be in there. He paused and said, This is big time news, isn't it? And Turner nodded. We'd prefer it if he didn't talk to the press. And Fenwick said, We could become a lot less understanding of your recreational activities if this becomes a front page headline. Ian's a reporter, and he knows. Everybody looked at Ian. Ian said, We'll have to see. Leave Billy out of it. You can deal with me on that. They took down Billy's address and phone number. After he left, I said, What a tangled web we weave. Why are we quoting Shakespeare? Fenwick asked. I said to Turner, You owe me ten bucks. Why? Last night, I didn't pay the guy. I don't see any proof, Turner explained. The bet from the night before to Fenwick. Then he said, Ben and I were in Au Naturel last night. So was I. So were half the gay people in the city, I said. But most of that half is not investigating this case. Did either of you see the judge? Fenwick asked. I didn't, Turner said. I wouldn't have recognized him if I did. He pulled the photo of the judge out of his regulation blue notebook and gazed at it. He shook his head. The face doesn't ring a bell. I was more concerned with Ben. You bring a date to a dancing bar? Fenwick asked. You mean a bar with dancing men or women? I corrected. Either. Why not? I asked. I wouldn't bring Madge to a place like that. I can picture her hooting as the men put money in some floozy's crotch. You couldn't take her because she'd laugh, carry on, and make fun, Turner said. She'd have too damn good of a time, Fenwick said. It was a place to go. And have fun, I said. Turner added, Although it is none of your business, neither Ben nor I put money in any part of anybody's clothing last night. I think they're both too shy, I said. I've been trying to get them over there, hang-ups. Is my being there going to compromise the case? Don't see why it should, Fenwick said. You didn't see anything. It was a coincidence, pure and simple. I don't believe in coincidences, and neither do you, Buck, Turner sighed. I am more concerned about Ben. I don't want him involved in an investigation. I think this blackmail angle has real possibilities, Fenwick said. I don't care what Billy said about the nobility of whores not blackmailing their clients. I can see the headlines, Turner said. Notorious homophobe in love nest with male prostitute. I'll have to keep it in mind. Do you guys remember Gary from last night? Fenwick asked. Turner shook his head. I nodded. So now what? I asked. I thank you for the big tip. We find out the name of the owner of the bar. Interview him or her. I said. Owner is Dennis Sickles. 
has a solid reputation in the community, supports a lot of good causes. I can try and dig up some information on her for you. Thanks. I'll see her and all the employees of the bar, including the dancers. Iron said, You want to stay on the case because secretly you're a lech. This way you get to talk to all the guys up close and personal. Turner ignored him and continued. Then see if anybody else saw him. Don't figure on a lot of people coming forward to volunteer that uh, they were there last night. It was an odd thing about the gay community. Many of the people who were at the bar last night would say they were openly gay. At least to varying degrees. However, there would be enormous hesitation about coming forward and admitting they were present. Especially if something criminal was known to be involved. This was a historical problem in the gay community. Everywhere. Although there had been specific local difficulties over time, not more than a year ago in Chicago, there had been a negative incident. Every patron of a gay bar, more than 50, had been ordered by the police to lie on the floor. They were then searched. The police claimed they had evidence that one of the patrons possessed drugs. The ACLU was interested in helping with the case, thinking that the suspected patron could have been searched but not every person in the bar, and that the constitutional rights of all the others had been violated. The difficulty had been in getting any of those who'd been present to come forward and testify. Other than the employees of the bar, only a few brave souls had been willing to speak out. Fear and mistrust of the police among gay people went back much further than just to the Stonewall Inn in New York back in 1969. Turner and Fenwick left the newspaper offices. In the car, Turner said, Well, that about tears it. How many cops do you know who were at a possible crime scene before it happened? It would add me to the suspect list. If I pursue the case, it's like I'm trying to let myself off the hook. Oh, we don't know. It's the crime scene. Did you kill him? Thanks for asking. No. Did Ben? No. Did I He's a little radical, but not nuts. He takes out his anger in the editorials and columns, he writes. So, nobody you know did the killing. What's the problem? Having you on the case might give us important information. In fact, it already has. Gay people, cops or both, would accuse me of selling out. Or you could just do your job and stop whining. I'm not whining. You're coming closer than any time since I've known you. If I ever whine, just pull out your gun and shoot me. I can live with that. I figured. Turner looked at his watch. It's after five. Why don't we stop at the bar? We might catch the owner there, or we can find out where she lives. We can start the questioning. At least we've got a notion on where Mead was last night. And blackmail is a possible motive. Does this clear up the paid-for-plane ticket problem? Turner asked. I don't know, Fenwick said. If he was a closet case, the whole trip could have been an elaborate deception designed to fool the wife and kitties. People are that desperate to hide? Not sorry. He might have been, if somebody ever outed him, after all. The grief he's caused gay people? It could be a major scandal. At the least, his marriage would be in deep trouble. Most probably over. Just realizing he was gay could have been enough stress to put him over the edge. You went through a hell of a lot of stress, but you handled it. It took a long time, and I was no saint. A Turner's wife had died when Jeff was born. In the months before his second son's birth, Paul had come to accept being gay. He'd come to love his wife as a friend, and her death had pained him deeply. He sometimes wondered what would have happened had she lived and had he come out to her. Certainly, their marriage would have been over. It was one of the great what-ifs of his life. I want to check in with Roosevelt and Wilson before we do more questioning, Turner said. Murder victims need to get organized. Fenwick said a little timetable of their movements would be helpful or a few more witnesses to the dastardly deeds. You're hallucinating again, Buck. Fenwick banged his fist on the dashboard. Ah, reality, I feel so much better. They called the station. 
Roosevelt Wilson's last known location was on Lincoln Avenue, and near the coffee shop, at the end of Montana Street. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides. And in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew. Reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.